Hi, welcome everyone. Um, we're delighted to have you join us for uh, the webinar today on child labor risks in global supply chains, uh, jointly hosted by Fair Labor Association and our colleagues at the Center for Child Rights and Business. I'm Sharon Waxman, you're pres the president and CEO of Fair Labor Association, and I will be moderating uh, this webinar. It's really wonderful to see so many new faces uh, online this morning. Uh, for those who don't know us, uh, FLA promotes human rights at work. We're an international network of companies, university, and civil society organizations collaborating uh, to ensure that millions of people working yeah, at the world's factories and farms are paid fairly and protected from risks to their health, safety, and well-being. And that includes children who might be at risk uh, in these supply chains. We've been a leader in creating high labor standards to protect children, particularly those that might be at risk in the agriculture sector. Some of our flagship programs uh, in the agriculture sector include our, our global accreditation company, uh, program for companies that meet our standards. Uh, we're also active uh, in Turkey across a range of commodities. Uh, we work on coffee across the globe and uh, particularly on cocoa in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Ghana and elsewhere. Uh, most of you uh, likely already know that the ILO estimates uh, that up to 160 million children are engaged in child labor meaning they're below the age of 18 and are working in jobs outside the family business. The child laborers are also, uh, as we know, unfortunately, <clears throat> unlikely to be in school. Um, and that's a situation that can perpetuate the cycle of poverty that drove them to work in the first place. We all know that addressing child labor is not simple. The root uh, causes are varied and extremely complex, but we also know that with the right resources, companies can reduce the risks of child labor or even eliminate them entirely. Today, we're going to explore some new data on child labor trends that will help us hopefully pinpoint where the risks are, as well as focus our time on what's happening in the United States with respect to child labor. And we'll talk about solutions and what can be done uh, to protect these children. We've allowed time at the end of the presentations for questions. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, ask you to add those questions to the Q&A box. So I wanna uh, start without further ado and introduce you to today's speaker, uh, Inez Kempfer is CEO of the Center for Child Rights and Business and she is joining us from Hong Kong. Uh, so welcome, Inez. Sally Greenberg is the executive director of the National Consumers League, as well as one of our treasured board members at the Fair Labor Association, representing our Civil Society Caucus. She's joining from Washington, DC. And Malin Lilliert is a director at the center and is joining us from New York. We're gonna kick it off this morning um, by hearing first from Inez, who will give us an overview of the center's new report on child labor risk trends across the globe. So Inez, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Sharon, for this introduction. I'm just pulling up my slides into um, slide mode. I hope you all can see uh, the slides that I'm sharing. And that my connection is fast enough. Yes, we can see. Um, it. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good morning, I think, to most of you um, here from Hong Kong. I'm really happy to share and quite excited to share a little bit about the study that we just published um, last week. And actually, this is the first full kind of presentation of the results in English um, that we're sharing with you um, all today. Um, the study that we published is actually a meta-analysis of 20 child rights risk assessments that the center um, has undertaken in the last um, three years. Um, at the center, we tried to understand um, how companies impact child rights, in particular in their supply chains. And in that context of, of that work, we have done these 20 child rights risk assessments across three industries, uh, manufacturing, agriculture, and mining, 
um, across eight sourcing countries. And all of these assessments have included qualitative on-site work um, on um, um, and a lot of um, conversations with um, key stakeholders. And that included nearly 1,800 children of um, um, mostly of workers um, in the supply chains and unfortunately also were, uh, children that were working within the supply chains, as well as um, a near, like over 2,700 parents um, who are working in these supply chains. And the results that we are um, sharing today really are not specifically on one industry and one country. So we're not going to tell you this is where you have the biggest risk, but we actually really want to show this is what we ultimately universally found as risks within supply chain that we do think is very valuable for companies to know, unless you only source in Switzerland. But if you're not one of those companies, then I think this is very relevant. Um, so um, the, the topics that we look at in those assessments are, you know, some very direct child rights issues such as child labor, access to education, access to child care, or the protection of young workers. And if I say young workers here, I'm talking of children that are in working age. So generally that's above 15, sometimes above 16, 17, but still under 18. Um, but we also looked at kind of impacting or surrounding factors such as working conditions, gender issues, um, and human trafficking and forced labor, as obviously all those child rights risks cannot be looked at in um, um, by itself, but in need to looked at in con uh, be looked at in context. Um, so I'm going to share a few cross-sector findings with you all. The, the report is available online. You can go and dig deeper. Um, the first finding is that, unfortunately, child labor is almost endemic in supply chains. Um, so we had in 50% of all the assessments, we had direct evidence of child labor. So we've even either observed it um, or we've talked to the children who were uh, involved in child labor very directly. Um, and this, although all of those assessments were always announced, they were always done with the knowledge of the people that we visited, et cetera. Um, in another eight assessments, we had indications of very high risk. So that means we didn't observe it ourselves um, and as in the other ones, but we, when talking to people, we understood that either in the um, immediate nearer lower tier supply chain, or for example, during harvest season, if we were not there during harvest season, there is a great indication that there is um, child labor risks. To give you some examples out of the 20, um, for example, mining in the um, of cobalt in the Democrat, um, in DRC in Congo, um, we've seen that um, of the 12 to 14 year olds, 10% of all the children living in nearby communities are working in the artisanal mines. And that number jumps up to nearly 20% um, of for children that are 15 to 17. And the work that you're doing is incredibly hazardous, um, often traumatizing, dangerous. Um, and so definitely some areas of worst cases of child labor that we've seen. But another example is uh, Turkey, where we've seen that um, children from the age of seven are working with their parents. And actually we saw that all the children that accompanied their parents, like, so if the migrant parents took their children with them, all the children were involved in work. And actually in this case, all cases had to be classified as child labor, um, given the, um, the age of the children, the working hours, the extensive working hours that they worked there and the conditions under which they worked. Um, we also do see child labor in production, um, not just in, in, um, in agriculture and mining. I mean, the last three years, the center has um, kind of dealt with um, 800 cases of child labor. Actually, it's more now, but that was it's just a rounded number. Um, and interestingly, the majority of those cases is in the first year level of, of, of factories. Um, but um, um, we have seen that um, I mean, that the reason that this is the case is not that we have more cases of child labor in first year factories. It's just that that's where the companies with whom we work with have, have visibility. We actually do see in the other cases where we get kind of like insights into the lower tiers that those cases are generally more severe, meaning the children's working conditions are worse, um, the age is younger, and often there's bigger groups within like, let's say one factory and one case that we're finding. So throughout a lot of evidence that obviously what we see is just the tip of the iceberg. And that in fact, there's much more going on in lower tiers where we didn't always have visibility. A second, second um, really crucial result that I think we all need to take into consideration is the fact that in none of the assessments that we have done, have we observed that 
the people working in the production, in the sourcing, in our supply chains would make enough to cover their basic living needs. So in all cases, the workers worked under what would be considered a living wage. And we've normally taken the more conservative number of living wage of different NGOs and CSOs who put out those numbers. Um, in manufacturing, we do see some manage to get the minimum wage. But for example, in agriculture, in many cases, um, the, their income is actually also under, um, uh, under the minimum wage. And that actually we can see on the right hand side um, coincides very closely and with also the feeling of or the, in the subjective assessment of the people, whether they think that their income is um, sufficient or insufficient to cover basic needs. And so this, this pinkish line shows how many people think it's not sufficient. So you see that, in, for example, in our assessment in garment in Ethiopia, 92% of the workers responded that what they're making is not sufficient to cover basic needs. And basic needs here is, for example, education. And we've seen that often this is even kind of worsened through the fact that education is hard to access and often expensive, even if officially schools are free, parents have to pay fees such for, for books, they have to pay cleaning fees, um, they have to pay fees for teacher associations, all of this then reasons for the parents to decide not to put their children in school, which obviously immediately increases the risk for of child labor significantly. And maybe to call out one, sorry, I should, um, oh, hang on a second, I think I'm, the wrong. Sorry, to call out one result that we saw in particular in manufacturing that we can kind of see how this um, sparse, sparsity of, of, of income makes worse is that there is a widespread lack of access to good quality affordable child care. This has been a really um, kind of throughout um, in different countries, different um, commodities, but throughout this was a really, really big challenge. Um, for parents and actually in many cases has led to parents taking children with them on the work floor and then often it was just a relatively small step as soon as the children get a little older to get engaged. Um, on this slide I just wanted to um, kind of stay with this point of, 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 of insufficient income because obviously that's also very closely related to the pricing and supply chains etc and some of the challenges. Um, is this the same the same chart as you saw on the previous um, um, slide on, on agriculture, um, but I just overlaid it here with some of the related child labor info that we had from those commodities. So you can see in the smallholder farms in Sri Lanka, where we can see that the minimum or the income is significantly under the living wage, we actually could also observe that 73% of the children start engaging um, quite extensively in the farm work before they um, they turn um, 12 years old. And then, I'm sorry, now my, somehow my Zoom window is covering up, um, is covering my, um, my slides. Sorry, I tried to um, solve that. Okay, yes, I, I managed to move that in. Sorry for that. Um, so the, and, and um, very similar results in, in, in coffee in Vietnam. Um, where you can see the income. So that's the red block. Um, the income is very low, even under the minimum age in the uh, minimum wage in that area. Um, there we had nearly 40% of children who were involved in coffee production. And in many of the other productions in that their parents were involved in. And when we talked to teacher, it turned out the children were missing up to six months of school. In Brazil, we saw children seven years old invo involved in farm work and heavy uh, farm work, and it's the same thing in Indonesia. So just kind of overlay those to really show these linkages and we have a quote on the bottom where it's just you know very clearly spoken out by a 12, 12 year old who just said my father's income was insufficient to spend on the education so of four children so I started to work at 14 so that my two younger um, brothers could attend school and that's just a story we heard over and over again. Um, as already kind of hinted to, the most salient child rights issues are often hidden in the informal and work and, and kind of lower tiers of our supply chains. Um, and um, just an example in Pepper, where we had 97% of the workers had just oral agreements. And that also means that often pay is lower. We saw also they are working relatively longer hours. And what that means for children in particular is that their parents um, are not involved in social protection schemes. and are thus more likely um, to also drop out of schools when shocks arise. So for example, when families um, 
um, have like somebody has an accident and and then that immediately means okay the family now doesn't have enough money anymore to um, cover those basic needs um, in mining this informality is a big challenge um, because the informal sector is the only area where many of the local population get access to work and we could see that actually of the youth that works in um in these areas, 75% are working in artisanal and informal mines. Um, and that's just because there's nothing else for them. So they don't have access to, to um, level of high school. And then there's no other schooling or vocational programs, et cetera. So the only kind of option for them is going to into this really hazardous work. And that leads me to this point here that throughout um, one very systemic kind of result we saw is that there's a lack of employment opportunities for young workers and that they're um, being systematically excluded from what we would call the first tier and the more formal sectors and then pushed into the um, lower tiers and often kind of an unintended consequence of some of the um, of some of the maybe like code of conduct driven work where we're saying, okay, we need to, you know, there's all these protections that makes it kind of difficult. So let's just not hire any young workers. Then we, we're not going to find an audit finding that pushes us. But really one of the consequences is that we see that the young workers suffer significantly because these um, more formal and often more safe workplaces are then totally excluded to them. And that was a result across the board that we saw. Um, and um, coming to, to recommendations and what we can do um, about this um, a little bit more, just very quickly, um, I think before I go into just a, a, what we also did in the study and also show that, uh, unfortunately, and that's not everyone, and I'm sure there's, you know, people on this call, I actually know some people on this call whose company is going really far and doing a lot, but generally we've had a real lack of visibility of companies into where, you know, where they produce. Um, we also see that really aggressive pricing structures um, um, and other kind of bad supplier management behavior really have an impact and they're driving child labor. Um, and um, on top of that, we see very few companies overall having a strong child labor um, centered remediation. And we also see a lot of the multi-stakeholder initiatives. And I think I'm honest if I say I would not put the FLA now in this in this group, but are very ineffective. There's a lot of, you know, like problem areas in certain sectors. And then it's like, okay, let's do multi-stakeholder initiatives. They're not bad. Um, we don't say you should not do that or join them, but we need to find ways to make them more effective and actually support um, children more. And I think we can do better. And we put in the in the report a range of um, um, recommendations. I'm not going to go into it for too long. Um, but um, one is really increasing visibility um, and transparency. For one, we think companies should be much more open about their child labor risks. Sometimes companies come to us very ashamed and feeling very embarrassed. And then they realize we are not surprised because as we know it's endemic, we know it happens. And actually, if a company comes to me tomorrow and says, I found this child labor, I'd rather be actually impressed with them because they, it shows that they have visibility and that they were not afraid to look. Um, we also advise companies to prioritize what we call transparency over traceability. So it's not so much about whether your hazelnut comes from exactly that farm that had child labor. If we know that this whole area does have a significant child labor issue, we should rather tackle that one than putting millions of dollars into tracing that my hazelnut maybe was not um, one of them. Um, which we find is also not feasible because um, of, of a lot of the pragmatic issues. Um, and then um, um, on obviously, I also pointed to kind of how business practices impact child rights and child labor. And therefore, we really um, encourage companies to establish stronger long-term partnerships with suppliers. And that's an old thing. I think, um, you know, I've, I was with the FLA, I think it is close 20 years ago, and we've talked about this at that time but unfortunately we see that um, um particularly i feel now kind of in the aftermath of COVID, um companies tend to make shorter agreements with with their suppliers and they want their supply chain to be more nimble which we kind of or which i understand but i think we need to be very much aware of what that means um for our supply chain management um, another very practical way is promoting decent work for youth and um, establishing family friendly workplaces. I'm just going to talk about one of them for one minute um, and promoting decent work for youth. This is just a picture from a, a program that we've started with IKEA and that has been ongoing ever since um, um, where companies are offering decent work um, 
um, opportunities for young workers age 15 and up. Um, and really do that very consciously, um, very carefully, and with a lot of consideration. But what we've seen at the results are amazing. Um, I think it's actually the company that is on this picture that has now been running this program for four years. I think they themselves have now given over 100 um, young workers opportunities to work at their factory, and each one of them is a child that was taken out of child labor situations. Um, and so that for us is just a very practical, very, very sustainable ways that business can deal with um, child labor, also child labor that is in the informal sector and invisible and often much harder to tackle. And then lastly, we encourage companies with a two minute, two minute warning. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, that's, I think, my last slide. So I think I'm. Um, nearly done so yes um so so the very last thing is the um is the remediation um i i know sometimes that's a difficult topic um because it can be costly but we do feel knowing that right now today we do have children working in our supply chains who miss out on the access of their basic rights that this creates a responsibility for companies that when they're aware of those violations that we need to step in and create solutions that are not pushing the children just out of the factories or out of that plantation into an even worse condition, but really support the children. Um, and that also means practically doing remediation, supporting their schooling, supporting their living stipends, etc. Um, and related to that, that we um, engage, continue engaging wherever possible. Sometimes it's not possible, but wherever possible, because just shifting suppliers or shifting risks again, in our experience, will not tackle the issue effectively, but just will, will have us going in rounds, but not actually support the children that are really negatively impacted. So hopefully with these recommendations, we have some constructive kind of ideas. And I know many of those things that we're going to talk about or that I just talked about do and apply for the situation in the US as well. So I'm very happy to continue the conversations on, on this. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Ines, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, it's really fantastic that you've gone and, and taken real cases, real people, real children, real human beings, and presented the findings in a way that um, help us understand really the, the gravity of the conditions and, and the scope of the problem. So it's a wonderful presentation, albeit discouraging, to see, you know, five and six year olds kind of trapped in a poverty of cycle, a poverty cycle, and uh, through through child labor. Um, so thank you for that. And um, you know, while this report does focus on a lot of countries, it does not cover. It was not intended to cover uh, the United States. So we've asked Sally Greenberg to bring that perspective into the conversation and talk about child labor in the US and what the Child Labor Coalition is doing uh, in response. Uh, so over to you, Sally. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Sharon. And thanks to all of our guests. Um, and uh, we appreciate the Fair Labor Association and Sharon who so ably run the organization and working with us to combat child labor throughout her career. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the National Consumers League on child labor problems in the United States. And sometimes that comes as a surprise to people that we have child labor problems in the United States. Uh, we understand that there are, are um, you know, millions of kids working around the world, but people are, uh, even US citizens are um, uh, shocked to learn that we have a child labor problem in the United States, but indeed we do. And I will say that my organization was founded in 1899 to eradicate child labor in the US and we made progress, but not nearly enough. Um, Reed Mackey, who's known to some of you and coordinates the work of the Child Labor Coalition is also on and he'll be available to uh, answer questions. Um, the Child Labor Coalition is our main uh, vehicle for uh, uh, working on child labor issues, both in the U.S. and uh, internationally. We have 40 members of that coalition it is run by the, the National Consumers League. Um, but members include the National Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers, the Solidarity Center, Human Rights Watch, and several uh, great farm worker groups. They're 
all coming together to combat um, child labor in the United States. And I want to uh, frame this for you uh, in terms of uh, three main categories of child labor violations that we see here in, in the U.S. Um, starting with the first, in the, it's um, uh, the, the problem is there are 300,000 uh, children working in the fields harvesting crops across the United States. Um, most are Latino. Many are U.S. citizens who are born here, uh, and most are from immigrant families from Mexico, Central, and South America. Many of these families have actually been picking crops in the United States for generations. Uh, by federal law, these youngsters must attend school, and most do, but on weekends, in summers, during uh, school breaks, they work, and some work 10 to 12 hour days, some six to seven days a week. And as agricultural workers, these youngsters are exempted from child labor law protections. Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, which was uh, adopted in 1938, actually exempted agricultural workers and it has provisions for child labor uh, protections. So they are not covered by those protections. 12 um, is the age that many children formally begin work uh, in, the, in, in agriculture, but there are loopholes on top of loopholes that allow even younger children into the fields. We see kids as young as five and six years old out with their parents because their parents have no other childcare options. Um, They're exposed to excessive heat pesticides, toxic crops like tobacco. We see children using razor sharp scissors to harvest and trim crops, trim crops, and they're exposed to many hazards that result in significantly uh, elevated injuries and fatalities. Many take their shade breaks, in fact, under vehicles and most experience a lack of sanitary facilities. The irony is that a 12 year old in the US cannot work in an air conditioned office for 12 hours, yet they're allowed to do backbreaking work in 100 degree heat on a farm. Our efforts to protect farm worker children include introducing congressional legislation, which we've done year in and year out, the Children's Act for Responsible Employment and Farm Safety. It's called the CARE Act, and it removes the loopholes that I just talked about. So the kids across the board in agriculture and everywhere else that they might be working are treated equitably. In addition to raising the age of farm work, the CARE Act would also raise the age of hazardous work from 16 to 18 years old, the same as all other U.S. workers. Um, and a second piece of legislation is the Children Don't Belong on Tobacco Farms Act. That's been introduced in our House of Representatives, and it would amend the Fair Labor Standards Act to prohibit kids under the age of 18 from working in tobacco fields, which are particularly toxic because the exposure to tobacco plants or dried tobacco leaves um, uh, is, is um, very bad for the kids' health. It exposes them to nicotine um, at, on the order of maybe a pack a day or more. Um, and this, would, this bill would deem this type of work as oppressive child labor. <clears throat> In the United States, a child must be 21 to buy tobacco products, ironically, but at 12, they can work in the tobacco fields. Um, and we find that there are kids working in the in the fields that are to uh, avoid this exposure to the, the tobacco plant. They, they wear plastic garbage bags with holes cut out for their head and hands. And this is often in over 100 degree Fahrenheit heat. So you can imagine how oppressive those conditions are. Um, efforts to get legislation passed seem like no brainers, right? But neither of the bills that we have um, pushed Congress to move forward um, uh, have, ha have done so. We've had a total of two hearings in the House of Representatives, I believe, in the last decade. Um, neither bill in the House, and we haven't had a bill in the Senate in over a decade to address these problems. Um, just a couple of uh, facts to um, uh, put the problem in perspective, over 60% of children under 16 who died working between 2018 and, to, and 2021 were working in agriculture. Um, and um, there's been a 
forty percent increase in um, child violations, uh, child labor violations that the DOL has uncovered, our Department of Labor has uncovered in twenty twenty two. Let me move on to a second category of child labor in the United States, and that is the problem of unaccompanied minor migrant children, reaching numbers of up to one hundred and thirty thousand who've been coming into the U.S. without their parents in record numbers. They are ending up in dangerous jobs, working midnight shifts in meatpacking, construction, factories, going to school the next day dead tired, working so they can send wages back to their desperately poor families in Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras, and to pay the coyotes who help them get over the border. The magnitude of this problem came to light through a, both a DOL investigation and a, an expose by the New York Times. The findings are alarming. Agencies found that kids working in several Hyundai supplier found, found children working in Hyundai suppliers in Alabama. The New York Times found, uh, uh, went around and did an investigative expose and found 100 kids performing work that was hazardous in 20 states. These workers are part of a new uh, economy of exploitation. Unaccompanied minors coming to the U.S. without their parents, with no close family here uh, or anyone to look after their welfare. They are extremely vulnerable to exploitation, and it's a shadow workforce that extends across industries in every state. They, they, uh, they, the, the presence of these children flouts child labor laws that have been in place for nearly a century. They, the New York Times found 12-year-old roofers in Florida and Tennessee, underage slaughterhouse workers in Nebraska, Minnesota, Arkansas, and five other states. They found children sawing planks of wood on overnight ships. Um, in South Dakota, children scrubbing dishes late at night, running milk machines in Vermont, and delivering food in New York City, harvesting coffee and building lava walls, uh, rock walls around vacation homes in Hawaii, with girls as young as 13 washing hotel sheets in Virginia. The labor force, this labor force, the unaccompanied minor uh, group, has been uh, slowly growing for a decade, but has exploded since 2021, while the systems meant to protect children have become over Overwhelm. Their presence here in the United States is a confluence of events. Their parents are not allowed to enter the country because of strict immigration laws. Their kids are, are sent over and they're desperate for work. Uh, the Biden administration as well did not want to keep these youngsters in holding pens, so has urged their swift release. And unfortunately, they do not receive the case management services they need and many fall victim to unscrupulous employers. Let me move to the third category of uh, child labor exploitation here in the United States. And this is happening or has happened in 10 states over the last two years. Roughly, half, uh, just to put things into context, roughly half of high school students who are also in school uh, will work at some point um, in, in their high school uh, experience. And um, and that's fine. And light work is fine. We have no uh, concerns about light work. We think that's a, a positive. But educational researchers have found that if children work more than 20 hours a week during the school year, their grades drop and their rates of school completion plummet. State and federal laws are needed, therefore, to prevent teen exploitation and keep them in school and safe. Federal law restricts workers to... Um, an 18 hour week of their under 16, allowing them to work three hours a day, as I said. It also prohibits many jobs that are hazardous, including construction, operating power saws, frying oil and fast food establishments, working at excessive heights like roofing jobs. Um, we want to keep them out of dangerous, uh, the, the idea is to keep them out of dangerous places like silos where they can suffocate after being engulfed by weed or other grains. And while these laws to restrict uh, um, teen hours are constantly under attack by business groups like the Chamber of Commerce, um, we learned through a Washington Post expose just a few months ago that we have a special cause for alarm today because a conservative group, the, the so-called Foundation for Government Accountability, was formed solely to undo state labor law protections. This foundation is funded to the tune of about $12 million by conservative donors who singled out states with Republican supermajorities who the FDA believes are easy marks to undo their child labor protections. They've succeeded in doing so in Iowa, Arkansas, and Minnesota. 
and are working to loosen protections in Ohio with a bill sitting on the governor's desk. There's very little in the way of organized groups fighting this juggernaut to undo labor protections in the U.S., aside from the Child Labor Coalition and our, our members and some disparate work um, from union locals. No national union, in fact, has taken on this work with us, unfortunately. Nor is there anything beyond nominal funds for the work we do to combat child labor. Indeed, NCL funds our child labor efforts solely with non-restricted funds that for other uh, the, that are contributed to the organization. What's disheartening about uh, state level attack on protections is that they're happening with the full knowledge of the consequences. Legislators, in states around the country that are introducing these bills, know that kids working in meatpacking um, are at risk, uh, yet they're trying to expand versions of the Iowa bill, for example, to um, expand work into these plants, loading docks into hazardous work areas. They also know kids are gonna get hurt and try to exempt employers if they did, um, including uh, uh, ramping up workers' compensation assistance. We think it's shameful. Um, uh, that that workers' comp section was removed from the Iowa bill, but many outrageous provisions remain, allowing 14 and 15-year-olds to work in cooler, refrigerated rooms and in industrial laundries, loading cars, trucks, and driving commercial vehicles at 16, assembling fireworks, and selling and serving alcohol. So there you have it. Those are three categories of child labor that are exploiting and harming our most vulnerable citizens in this country. So um, in closing, I would say that we need legislators and the public to man demand that we protect uh, children from uh, ch uh, to, from child labor hazards. But um, Sharon and I penned a um, uh, an op ed um, not too long ago that talked about how companies must develop and publicly communicate uh, a commitment to ending child labor and implementing a clear company code applicable applicable to all employees and business partners. Uh, companies can understand the risks, must understand the risk of child labor in their own operations, and um, companies must also provide consistent ongoing training and communication about their zero tolerance policies toward child labor and ensure that expectations are clear. So that uh, that gives you a thumbnail sketch of what we're experiencing here in the United States, where it's an uphill battle. We appreciate everybody's participation, and we really uh, look forward to working with uh, many of you to stem this uh, growing problem of child labor in the United States. Sally, um, thank you so much for that uh, really thoughtful and kind of almost, I mean, harrowing uh, explanation of what we're facing in our own country for those of us who are who are calling in from the United States. I mean, it really paints. A, um, a holistic picture of the challenge here that so many Americans think is only a challenge uh, overseas. So thank you for you know bringing that perspective into the conversation. Uh, Sally, you started to talk about some of the solutions uh, and focus a little bit more on what business can do, what companies can do to uh, to address this challenge. And now Malin is going to drill down and um, give us a, a little bit more <clears throat> insight about what companies can do with a particular focus on the US. So over to you, Mullen. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. And thank you also, Sally, for providing us with this expose over the challenges that we find here in the US. So I just wanted to take um, a few moments just to also introduce the Center for Child Rights and Business. Uh, so we are, the abbreviation is the center. So you see me and, and Ines here, but we are actually 50 people uh, across the world. Uh, we are located in the major sourcing hubs in, in Asia. We also have staff on board in Africa and in Turkey and in Europe, and then myself uh, here in the US. And we have been working during the last 11 years since we were established in Beijing, China, uh, working directly with businesses on trying to support them uh, with the challenges that they are experiencing in the supply chain uh, relating to child rights. And that can be everything from supporting migrant parents to child labor uh, prevention and remediation, the child rights impact assessments that you have seen, setting up the, the young worker programs and so forth. So I just wanted to give you that uh, sort of a background on, on who we are and um, a little bit why we are here today. Um, so first of all, 
I think that when I, then now based in the US, uh, been working for the center for, for 10 years in various locations, saw the revelations that came out in February about the child labor um, issues that we've seen, and that's been almost on a weekly basis now uh, here in the US, I thought, wow, this is, this is more or less the same that we see in, in other countries. Um, so we have a range of issues that Ines has mentioned in, in the global study that we can also see here in the US. And that's uh, the issues that we have been working on with more than hundreds of companies uh, directly to try to provide uh, support. So we see, first of all, it's about knowing your supply chains, create that visibility into your supply chain. Who are your subcontractors? What kind of policies and procedures do they have in place? How are these being implemented? How are these being monitored? Uh, one key issue here in the United States that was not mentioned that much in the global study is the use of labor agents, uh, labor agencies. We see that they are playing a big part in some of the sort of revelations of child labor across, across the state. So who are they? When you sign a contract with these uh, labor agents, are you sure that they have responsible recruitment policies in place? Are they following that? How are you monitoring them? Are you doing any follow-up when they have put in workers in your facility? Are you doing any kind of worker service? Are you talking to perhaps the migrant workers that have arrived to get, uh, under the contract with these labor agents, how they are being treated? Management of labor uh, agents and agencies are actually key. Um, training and capacity building, we see that that is also needed here. And that can be from sort of everywhere from the top level uh, management also down to also uh, auditors, being it uh, in-house auditors or third-party auditors about how to um, identify child labor risks, but also how to deal with child labor when this is happening. Uh, what do you do when you, when you see a child? How do you talk to the child to not scare the child away? We have unfortunately heard that many of the kids that were part of the revelations under the New York Times investigation, for example, many of those have actually now disappeared. Uh, they have never had the chance of a proper remediation program, which they do have the right for, where we uh, take a child-centered approach to remediation and ensure uh, that their needs are taken into account. By also looking at what are the needs of the business? How can we prevent this uh, from happening again? Uh, so training and awareness building, what are the legislations that are in place? What kind of work can youth do? How can we support youth to have access to decent work? Uh, what kind of protection do they need? How can we create workstations that are suitable for young workers? Uh, how can we support them? What kind of skills training do they need? Um, so all in all, very short, I know that I've seen that there are a number of, of uh, of questions coming in, but I think that we are here as the center um, in the United States uh, working on these issues. We have long experience on how to tackle them. We know, of course, that the uh, environment is slightly different, but we see that there are many of the same issues that are coming back again and again. And I think that we have some fairly good tested approaches on, on how to sort that out. So we are happy, happy to continue that conversation with you. And I think uh, over to you, Sharon, then we go ahead with some questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much um, for a really concise and, and rich presentation. And we do have a lot of questions, um, which is fantastic. So maybe I will kick us off uh, and ask you know, one of these questions and then maybe turn it over to Shelley, who I know has been uh, reviewing the multiple questions that have come in and uh, she, she'll ask, uh, she can focus on the rest. Um, one question, and I think this is probably best put to the center, uh, is what can a company do if the underaged worker provides apparently adequate documentation indicating they're of age to work in their company? Inez? <laughs> Sorry, I was looking at, at Molly. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, one of the things that we do with a lot of companies is is helping them to do to do thorough age verification. Um, 
I must say that I, I think I have a statistic somewhere. I, I just want to point this out that the majority of child labor cases that we have observed, I think it's about 80% of the children came in without any ident identification. So, so that, that kind of impression that this is often just an issue of, of ch children cheating, that does happen. I'm not saying it never happens, but it's, it's definitely in a minority of cases. Um, these cases often can be addressed um, or could be addressed quite well because we often we often see that the reason why children could come in with with documentation that might look proper but isn't was because the hiring process were done quickly and and often carelessly. Um, there may be some very sophisticated cases, but to be quite frank, I don't think that is the biggest risk. I think in most cases that we have been dealing with, companies were kind of aware that there might be issues, but just accepting them because maybe they needed the labor urgently or they just didn't have the personnel in place to look at this very carefully. So I don't know if you fully answered the question, but yeah, just a quick answer on this. Reed, do you have your hand up? To uh, yeah, um, Sharon, I just wanted to- Oh, you were maybe just waving hi. <laughs> uh, Sharon, I just wanted to jump in. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree uh, with, with Inez's comments. Um, uh, we're seeing some really ridiculous cases where like 14 year olds are saying they're 34 years old you know, so a lot of the companies, at least in the U.S. context, um, in meatpacking firms and, you know, auto suppliers, they know these kids are underage and they're just looking the other way, um, is our belief. And also the other thing is that, um, so, you know, um, Arkansas recently removed its work permit process uh, for uh, teen workers, which provided a really important age verification step. And uh, that's happening. You know, there are other states like Missouri that are considering that as well. So we really need states to adhere to this work permit process and, you know, verify the kids' ages before, um, and also their tasks, because a lot of kids are doing dangerous tasks that, that you know, a state official can, can, uh, can see and spot and, you know, and talk to parents and the kid, tell them not to do it. Great. Thanks, Reed. Okay, Shelly, next question. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions related to the deeper tiers of the supply chain. And, and as you touched on that, so I think the question is really more around um, how do you find the deeper tier problems? And then even if you find them, uh, what are some steps for remediation? And obviously, um, well, depends on the context. But first of all, a lot of companies are telling us how could, can we know. When we do um, um, child rights or generally human rights risk assessments, I, I must say it's not that hard to identify your risk areas because a lot is known. There's a lot of NGOs out there. There's the FLA, for example, that's provided so much data on what is going on in our supply chain. And what is just really important for companies is to accept that and not to think, oh, it's probably not the case in my supply chain. Well, it's mostly like when if you're producing or if, you, if you're sourcing this commodity and you hear from NGOs saying there's probably an issue, then that issue very likely also applies to those companies. And I think that's a first step to be acceptant that there are challenges and then look into where do I have the biggest risk and where do I want to dig deeper? We do understand companies can do that everywhere, but there's a lot of organizations out there that help with that. I mean, we ourselves do a lot of assessments, which is part of that. And then how we address it. Um, I mean, first of all, we do think um, often the very first step has to be remediation if violations are directly observed that are somehow linked, maybe not directly, but indirectly to our production. But then also really understanding in that remediation process, why did this happen? And not just like, oh, the kid had a fake ID. That's not really the reason why it happened, right? That the, the fake ID is, is, is just a means to get access to the job. Why was the, the factory, the plantation hiring those children? Why do the families rely extensively on their own children to work 40 hours a week? Is that because the pricing isn't just, et cetera? And I think we need to, we need to tackle those hard questions. I know companies often don't want to tackle those questions, but we need to look at why is it so needed from um, but by by so many communities to rely so heavily on children. Like what is what is the underlying factor? And I think particularly in supply chains in Asia and Africa, a lot of it has to do with pricing mechanisms um, and how how much we value or do not value the people who produce produce our goods. Yeah, and I think related to that um, is informal versus formal sector, like how, where you see the differences on that um, in terms of being able to identify versus and remediate. 
I mean, it should be easier in the informal in the formal sector. Obviously, often we have either gates or um, fences or, or walls um, that allow us to to see what, what's going on. Um, I think what is very important when we tackle child labor in the formal sector is that we are being very careful not to just um, move the problem. Um, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of the child labor um, prevention has been doing that. It was, I want to prevent from these children to be in my factory and to be where I see them. I think Bangladesh garment sector is a very stark example where I would we totally agree that if we go into the, I don't know, 600 something factories that have been involved in Alliance and ACOR um, or just worker safety programs in the last couple of years, you won't find a lot of child labor um, because we have made very clear that companies understand it's not allowed, etc. But the moment you go down just one level, washing houses, printing houses, mills, we have lots of cases of child labor and it's not that hidden. And I think all we did in the formal sector, because there's a real issue, like that the pricing is a real issue. Um, the pressure on, 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 on suppliers is a real issue, um, and we have widespread poverty and school dropouts. So these two things combined just create the market for child labor that we do need to consider. Karen, do you want me to keep going? Um, or do you um, to yeah, I, I can pick it up from here. Um, Sally, I think there was a question here about if you can repeat the stat about the number of hours a week that uh, significantly decrease graduation rates and say a little bit more about uh, about that research. Right, right. So um, the the data that uh, that has been compiled over many years is that if kids um, under 18 work more than 20 hours a week, it significantly diminishes their ability to go to school, uh, their performance in school. And um, the, the, um, when we see particularly with uh, child farm workers, their inability to be in one school over um, their, their high school careers because their families are migrant uh, farm workers and they go from, uh, they go where the harvest is. So they may go to Michigan, they may go down to the, um, North Carolina, and um, it, what, what it means for them is constant upheaval, and their dropout rates are um, much higher. These kids are in school, and they're supposed to be in school uh, when they're not. Um, the only time they're supposed to be allowed in working working in agriculture is when they're not in school, if they're under, um, what is it, 16 years old or 12 years old, uh, Reed. But yes, 20 hours a week is um, is sort of the tipping point. And uh, we're um, uh, we've got some other uh, good data on on the the dropout rates and you know uh, other areas that that create problems for kids to succeed in these um, uh, in these environments. Reed, do you want to jump in with any other uh, um, data points? Uh, no, I think Sally, you've really hit it. You know, we do think that uh, probably at least two thirds of the kids are dropping out. Uh, migrant kids that that are um, you know working in agriculture. Uh, the the federal government keeps really poor data on this. Even the migrant education program doesn't you know officially have a dropout rate. Um, but when you talk to migrant educators, they tell us that in some communities it may it may be as high as eighty percent. Mm. Great. Um, harrowing. Uh, there are still questions about uh, the importance of age verification and really more specifically, you know, what, what is the concrete recommendation? Um, so maybe uh, let me ask the question this way, Inez or Malin, are there successful remediation cases that you have worked on where companies have had this challenge I mean, you know, appreciating what you're saying about, you know, the the false documents not not really being the issue, but obviously for many companies it is an issue. Um, so, how have you successfully addressed that that particular issue uh, with companies? 
I can start, Marlene. Um, I mean, so one one thing that is important when we do remediation that it always has the two levels. One is focused on the child, and one is focused on the factory or the plantation that's been found to to have the child labor. Um, on the child, that there, as as I think we mentioned, it's really you know ensuring that the needs of the child are covered and we're creating solutions that are actually improving the life of the child, not just you know making it worse um, by maybe you know. Um, hindering the child of working in a in a in a factory that wasn't that bad and just sending them to an even worse factories are really important to actually remediate the case but then we do work with companies very practically on improving their um for example HR education processes a lot of times that means to improve their hr processes in general to ensure that they do have um um, do um, do proper um, like interviews and do proper checking of documents, etc. Um, and and also you know double like that. This doesn't happen with like I mean there's an extreme example that Reed mentioned, but I think it's very common. But sometimes it's a bit more subtle, obviously. But we're working with companies to really look into um, in documents. A lot of times um, there is ways to also under or, or find fake um, um, ID cards. I think one of the most popular trainings that we have in China is how to find um, you know, identify fake fake ID cards. Um, so there's definitely ways that the companies then can ensure to um, not, you know, have another child um, being found in the next audit. I do think it it's just really important at the same time to understand why the companies, um, maybe for example, um, um, human resource practices were bad. Um, and that maybe relates to a question that I saw in the Q&A as well, that, that often when companies... Um, cope with, for example, insecurity or not being sure when the next order is coming, et cetera. They have very bad coping mechanisms, which is, for example, using just labor agents that bring them a lot of workers one day and can take them with them the next day. Um, and that is when they don't do the the, uh, the the right checking. And when we've a lot of cases in first tier have been in this in these contexts where um, labor is um, hired on very short term as, as daily laborers or hired through third party labor contractors. Um, these, this has every time increased the risk and I think important for the companies to see the linkages to potentially their sourcing practices as well. So it's actually a three level remediation. So with the child, with the supplier, the factory, but also understanding how buying practices um, impact the situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have time probably for one more question. We have two minutes um, and uh, someone is asking, you know, in the case of migrant workers, what should remediation look like for children who are working at sites with their parents who are constantly moving and chasing rural agricultural work? I mean, this is something that we, you know, have faced um, in our work uh, in Turkey, for example. It's a big challenge. So how, how do we solve it? Well, I, I can jump in with some thoughts. Um, one of the issues is child care. Uh, one of the reasons that children are in the fields with their parents is their parents don't have uh, don't have child care options and they're not going to leave them up at home alone. So they want to uh, have them close by. They bring them into the fields and uh, our farm worker kids who we work with tell us that over and over again. And then they end up working because uh, often it's piecework and, you know, you have to get a, a kilo of strawberries, whatever, and the kids, you know, can help. Uh, increase the uh, the volume and um, and you know whatever pennies they add to the family income uh, it it, um, it it's it's um, acceptable to uh, the growers and and the families really have very little choice. Um, there are a number of education programs um, for kids who work in the fields uh, that that Reed and I work with, uh, and and there is certainly a concerted effort to address this problem, but it's um, very um, inadequate. Uh, and it's also hard to identify um, many of the gr uh, growing, the growers are in far flung places, and we don't have good data uh, about where they, where they are, um, uh, where the fields are, the in, uh, investigators have a hard time finding uh, uh, where uh, children are working when they go in and do a do a really uh, rigorous investigation. It's that they're really hiding in plain sight, but um, we don't have lists of growers. Uh, so it's very hard to track down uh, where these um, where these kids are unless there's a really pointed and concerted effort. Um, we um, uh, read, we, we've got some other programs that we work with like AFOP um, that works with children uh, and tries to 
make sure they're safe. And when they're out in the fields, there's education programs and, and recreational programs for them. Uh, anything um, that we wanna uh, shed light on um, and how those programs are, are, are working? Or maybe you can share a list of the programs, you know, after the webinar, since we are officially on, yeah. um, so people can have a, a reference document or email. If we can do that, that would be fantastic. I also think it'd be great if we could share the op-ed that uh, you and I wrote, um, Sharon, that has suggestions um, and guidance for companies um about uh developing protocols to ensure that their uh, workforce is um child labor free yes thank you so sally's going to get the last word um so i just i really want to thank uh sally reed and as and mullen for joining all of us today on the webinar um, and thank all of you who have joined us live it's a, such an incredibly important topic that we really need everyone from the CEO to the consumer to take action uh, and take responsibility to protect children. Um, you know, children, as we all know, really belong in schools, not working long hours in factories and farms. So please um, stay in touch with the Center for Child Rights in Business, the National Consumers League, and Fair Labor Association through the contacts on this page. Um, and thank you very much again for joining us. And this concludes uh, our webinar. Thanks, thank everyone. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.